all those little edges will be covered by the paper lines so that where the gaps are between this color and the next color, those will all be covered up and sealed off and hidden away underneath. And nobody knows how that's done except us. It's like a deep, dark secret. It's a trap. <laughs> so that, that, and that. Okay. And so when that prints now, when you cut, you always have to have the key line first. That's why it's called the key line, because it's the key to your whole image. Then you cut these layers. When they print, they're going to print one color prints first, the next color prints next. They don't exactly touch. Sometimes they overlap. You know, there's like that little kind of looseness there. And then when this prints on top, it'll clean all that up and hide all that and pull the whole image together and add all the detail and look really super, okay? So see how that'll work? So as soon as we get this on the screen, then we let the screen dry and we're ready to start printing. So you cut from the key line, you cut all the colors, and then when you print, you print the colors first and the key line goes last. All right, does that make sense? A little bit? So this is why they call this kind of stuff color separation. So you have your image and you have in your head a, an idea of where you want the color to fall. Um, and then you have to make them separate like that. You have to say, I want this color here and I want that color here and I want the key line to look like this. And then you have to rebuild that and construct those layers and stack them on top of each other again. And when we get into printing, then we're going to have to know exactly where we're putting each color every time. Because if anything moves, then the colors are going to move. And then instead of matching up, they're going to be like all over the place and you'll be just chasing them around the paper. Okay, but there's easy ways to do that. Okay, which we will, of course, learn. All right, and so this is now ready to be burned on the screen. So that means when we say burn, uh, we mean use light to transfer these images to that photo emulsion. So we can leave this here and bring these into the coating room. So here's what we had that we were looking at on the table, and it's all bright reading. Everything's facing like right side up the way she cut it. And so again, in screen printing, we could burn this to print backwards, you know, if we want. But generally we print things the way we set them up. Okay, so in order to get that to happen on here, these have to go face down. And let's see if we put one there, and we put one there, and we put one in here. Maybe I'll put the smaller one over here, and the bigger one up there. How about this? Two small ones and one big one. All right, so these, I'm just trying to kind of put them so they're not too crowded in there and uh, there's plenty of room to print them. So we don't want to, we don't ever use these edges of the screen. You'll notice in some cases, it's not really good shop practice, but in some cases people don't even clean this kind of two inches along the edge here because we never burn anything there. You, it's very difficult to print if you burn your images right up to the edge here. So you try to keep everything centered in the middle of the screen if there's plastic layers like this, if the plastic overlaps the plastic, it's not a problem, okay? It's all clear. These can't touch each other, of course. So we want them in the middle of the screen as much as possible, fairly close to each other. And if they're all facing the same way, sometimes it makes it a little easier to print because if one's facing this way and one's facing that way and one's facing this way, when you go to print, then you're kind of constantly turning the screen and trying to figure out, you know, which end is up. And so just a way of sort of being organized. You can look at it, you can sort of see that everything's facing the right way, and uh, just kind of helps you keep everything neat. All right, so face down, and then just with a little bit of tape, hold these in place. <coughs> Get one piece to hold both of those. In there. And that's all it takes. We just don't want them to like flip over or fold under or anything like that when we're putting this into the plate maker. But you don't have to tape them like solid all around, okay? Just enough that when it goes like this, they don't tend to flop, okay? And then uh, here is the plate maker. And you um, always want to check the glass to make sure that the glass is fairly clean. Sometimes, you know, there's days when we have like 
classes, two or three classes in here. By the end of the day, this glass will get all gunked up with little bits of emulsion and glue and even ink that didn't dry. And so if anything that's on here, even a piece of dust, a little speck of, you know, there's a blue speck there. See? Uh, even uh, scratches like this, uh, those things are going to block light and then they can reproduce on your screen. And sometimes they reproduce just in the form of tiny little holes in the emulsion. So they're little tiny things you can almost hardly see, but they're going to block light. And so there's going to be a little bit of emulsion that washes out there. And then when you go to print, it's like, you know, this starry sky. <laughs> and you're going to have all these little dots of color printing where you don't want them. And then you're like, where'd that come from? Um, so you have to try to make sure this is clean. If you want, you can always get the glass cleaner and a Kim wipe or two. And this spray bottle's not working very well, but And it's always good to check because sometimes people will put, put a screen that is still wet so they'll put it in there and the emulsion will dry on there so you just always want to check that it's clean because I've done it before where I put a screen I've been in a hurry and I put a screen down and then all of a sudden oh no there's that giant glob that I didn't check that was there from somebody else's previous screen. You can just sort of gently go over this with a uh, razor blade at sort of a little angle so you don't scratch the glass any more than it already is. And it, you know, picks up a certain amount of gunk off of there. And then just dry that. And we're going to be using fairly small screens, probably right in the middle here. So if we clean that central area, that's probably enough for us to get by. And the other thing, too, is in the future, you guys might be using, we'll probably be using oil to baby, baby oil your your uh, images. So when you use the baby oil on there, you'll have traces of the baby oil. So just be sure that after you're done to clean that up as well. Yeah, the nice thing to do is if you notice you've got something on there from one thing or another, you take your screen out and you're trying to be really careful but somehow there's sticky things on there, it would be to clean it off before you leave. Not just to like, oh well, look, stuff got on the glass, bye. <laughs> like clean it off. So if there's just one of you burning, you could put the screen right in the center here. If there are two people ready to go, there's no reason we can't put one here and one here and burn two screens at the same time because we're all doing the same thing, same artwork, it'll be the same exposure time. And that'll just, you know, save a little time rather than, you know, one by one by one. And we can kind of spread ourselves out a little. All right, and so then there is a rope in here which should be tucked just under the edges of this little plastic tab here because this is where the bleed is for the vacuum. So there's a vacuum that's going to be created between this thing and the glass that's going to hold your film really tight up against the emulsion. If we don't do that, then things are kind of loose and you get, instead of a sharp clean edge, you get sort of a fuzzy edge, like a shadow. So these go just under the edge. You don't have to stuff them under there too much. You can't cover this, like if you stuff too much of this under there or you put a screen on top of here, then the vacuum can't pull the air out like it's supposed to, and so it creates all this uneven pressure, and this glass can explode. And then it costs $5,000 to get a new piece of glass for this, because it's tempered glass with a hole drilled in it for the vacuum. So, like, please be careful of that. Okay, so in there, nice, the rope just hangs over. The purpose of the rope is to help draw the air towards that vacuum hole. Okay, so it's just kind of a little aid since we have a few, I think, holes in the top of this thing that helps us kind of get the air out of there. Uh, all right, then there is a timer and there is a vacuum pump here. So uh, the vacuum pump, well, let's do the timer first because the vacuum is noisy. So on the front of the plate maker are a series of different emulsions that we use and the different kind of exposure times that we use for burning different materials. So the more opaque something is, the more time it can tolerate in exposure. And then if something's a little weak, uh, it, it, you have to be a little more careful about how you expose. So things like ha ruby lith or amber lith or paper, you know, cut paper, are super opaque. So we almost can't make a mistake with those. That's why we do this project first. So if you burned it for five minutes in there, it'd be fine. <laughs> if you burned it for one minute, it'd be fine, okay? 
But when we get into more kind of delicate things, like uh, we're printing half tones out on the computer, and we're printing a little layer of toner that's on the you know computer paper. It's not like thick vellum or or thick uh, ruby lith or anything. It's very delicate. Then we can't. We have to be really careful about exposure times. So if we overexpose a piece of vellum with lines on it or dots or fine detail, eventually the light is going to sort of break through that layer of uh, toner and expose that area, and so we don't get a good burn. So you have to pay attention to the different times and um, you know watch this, and you have to kind of watch the emulsions too. Right now we have the brown, this brownish purple emulsion, and so um, you know we have some time set for that, but depending on if they run out or what they send us or somebody donates something and it's free, we take it, then we'll figure out what the exposure time is and you know we may have a different exposure time for that material. All right, so um, amber lith or ruby lith, it looks like burns about 60 with this emulsion, okay? And paper is even more opaque than, than ruby lith, so it'll be fine at 60. So to set the time, you there's a little just digital print out here. So six and Zero, okay? So just these buttons are all you have to touch, really just the two, you know, the decimal digits. If you touch this one down here, it moves the decimal point. So now it's six instead of 60, all right? So watch that. You have to check that every time. And chances are, you know, we'll all be burning screens today, so it's probably going to be set the same. But if one of the advanced students is burning something different, they might change the time, and then you have to come back in here. So like this time, it's something you want to note on your um, log, all right? So that you remember that. For this kind of material, this is how long you expose with this emulsion. You can write the brand name of the emulsion down off of the container. So you could bring your log in here with your book and fill in the emulsion name and write down how you coated the screen, how many coats, you know, two times one, and what the exposure time is, okay? You can do that right now even if you haven't even exposed the screen yet. But then make sure you do that. Uh, so once that's set, then we have to set this vacuum up. So we're gonna turn the pump on and just close, this is like a kind of a little safety valve. So we're just gonna close that by turning that sideways, okay, or perpendicular to the stem. It's like just like a gas line or, you know, different things you have at home. And then we wait for that vacuum to build up. And there's, there is a little <coughs> dial here. It doesn't read because somebody kind of pushed the glass in, I think it's touching it. Uh, but that should tell us when we have about the right pressure. The other way to tell is just by looking at the top. When you see that, now you can see all the air is getting like sucked out of here. And you can see the rope, okay? Nice and tight. You see the frame nice and tight. Then you're good to go, okay? Then it's holding it down. And so to start it, it's this button right here that says start. And you want to hit that with just a firm tap, all right? If you poke it, it'll go on and then on and then you're not getting enough light, okay? So you wanna try? You hit the start button. But do we press it down? Yeah. Oh, good. Looks good, see the lights on, and it hasn't gone off. And usually if it stays on for the first four or five seconds, then it's okay, all right? But you wanna check that and make sure that goes on. It just pushing the button doesn't always mean the light will go on, you know? Because again, we have a lot of people in here who experiment and so they may be pushing buttons on this, and it's a very sensitive machine, and so if people push a lot of buttons, it just sort of shuts down, and uh, then it won't work, and we have to kind of restart it. So this timer is very sophisticated. It has like its own little brain, and it's connected to something in here that we talk about burning for like 60 seconds. They're not actually seconds, they're what are called units. And so inside here is a device that measures the output of UV light from the from the bulb. So it only met, it only allows a certain amount of UV light to hit that screen. Okay? And 60 is sort of the number we put for how many units we want. But as the bulb gets old and is weaker, it might extend the time a little bit to compensate for that, because it's actually measuring light emissions, not time. And so sometimes you'll notice when it's counting down, it'll go kind of normally and then it'll start going real slow at the end. That usually means the bulb's wearing out and it's kind of, you know, dragging itself a little bit to make sure that not light gets on the screen. Then that just shuts itself off. You don't have to do anything else there. All you really have to do is on and off, but you don't have to off and set the time. So then the pump can go off 
and the valve open. So sometimes you set this on here, you know, vacuum and this. Those are the only things you really have to touch, okay? Make Push sure buttons. not to turn off the power because if you turn off the power, it takes a while for it to recharge again. So you're, it'll lag for everybody else. So just when you're looking at the, make sure that you're, the one that you're flipping is the pump. You, can, you can imagine, like at home, if you have a 60 watt light bulb and it's been on for a little while, it's like really hot, like you can't touch it. So this is like 5,000 watts. So the bulb gets really hot. It's got a fan in there to keep it cool. And if you just shut the machine off all of a sudden, sometimes it'll ruin that bulb because it's just like, ah, you know, I'm too hot, I can't stand it and it melts or something. So if uh, when you are ready to burn your screen, you want me to come back in here and walk you through it again, don't hesitate to ask because it's complicated and it's a little intimidating at first. And uh, so, you know, I don't want you to feel like, okay, you heard it once, now go do it. <laughs> you might be like, I don't know, I'm not sure. So just don't hesitate to ask, okay? So now if we lift off one of these, look underneath, can you see? There it is. Oh, yeah. Okay, so where the light has hit the emulsion, there's been a chemical reaction and it's actually hardened the emulsion here. But this is the emulsion, the original emulsion, that didn't get any light on it. So it's still water soluble here. And when it has that reaction, it leaves this little kind of shadowy trace, which we call a latent image. And not all emulsions have a latent image, but this one does. And it's just kind of nice because when you take your film off, you're like, oh, phew, I think everything's going to be okay, you know, because I can see my image on there, all right? It's not a, a total guarantee, but pretty good. All right, and... Walk it in here. So you do want to keep track of your film. If you leave it in there while you wash out the screen, that's fine, because you usually don't want to get that film wet. And this room is pretty, you know, messy. Um, don't lose those, because if something terrible happens and somebody steals your screen and washes it out or you know, I don't know, who knows what it starts to fall apart. You may have to reburn it. So you want to save those. And they're reusable. Look, there they are. So she could print this now, run some postcards. Then she could say, I think I'll do a few t-shirts. And so to print t-shirts, she has to set it up differently and put each color on a separate screen. But she's still got all her artwork, so she can set it up to run some t-shirts later, okay? Um, so that's kind of a, a nice thing. Now, it's not like the paper stencil. You had to just, like, tear it off and throw it away. Or it's, like, done for. This, you can reuse stuff. So either sprayer, but no power, all right? This one probably is the best, but if somebody's using it, you can use that one, but don't turn the power on. Um, and no other chemicals. So those spray bottles out of there. Uh, if somebody else is in here cleaning a screen or doing something else, the rule is whoever has burned the screen gets priority. So you just say, excuse me, and put your screen in there, and they'll stop what they're doing and step aside and let you wash it out because this has to get done, you know, fairly, fairly quickly. So because those areas are still water soluble, so what we're going to do is mix it with water. And the water will start to break down that emulsion that's left and you usually see a little kind of bubbles or sudsiness in the water.
washed out, it'll look like this. Don't stop until everything is clear and open. you get everything and it looks clean. There might be, you know, a few little bits of stuff in there from the way the screen was cleaned, um, but this looks fine. And any of these little tiny bits that you might see in the middle of a big open area like this, when we print, there will be enough ink around that those will just close up and disappear. Okay, they're not going to show. Right? So this has to dry. It can go in front of the fan on the side of the room here. something to print on. So there are some already cut pieces of paper in a box over there. You're welcome to use any of that. If you don't find something you like or the size is not right, you can go through the rack, find paper, and give it to me, and I'll cut it down to the size you need on the big cutter. Because we want these to be all the same size, all right? We don't want to be cutting them by hand and have all these big, small, you know, all these crazy little things. Everything real consistent. If you want to set this up to be like a card, you know, with a fold, then you can make it like twice as big and figure that you'll print on one edge and then fold it. And I have a lot of envelopes over there under the TV set. So you can try to find some paper, measure, make sure it matches envelopes. You pull out like two dozen envelopes and then make about 25 or so cards. And you should come out with enough cards to make, you know, nice little thank you notes or, you know, anything you want out of there or sell them, okay? All right, any questions? So as soon as you've got that film cut and you're ready to go, let me check it and then find your screen and we'll get these burned today and maybe even start printing, okay? All right, good. 